Hey everyone, Carlson here to continue on our learning about the muscular system with part two of our video lecture. We're going to pick up at 7-4 we're going to talk about communication between the muscles and the nervous system. The, the area where they meet is called the NMJ or neuromuscular junction as shown by this picture here where we have an axon terminal and then a muscle fiber where they meet up and the area in between is what we call a synaptic cleft. So a motor neuron will control an individual muscle fiber and its single axon will penetrate the paramysium and become part of that junction at that terminal. Uh, the terminal contains mitochondria and vesicles of ACH to help make that contraction happen and the role that the acetylcholine plays is it's a neurotransmitter that communicates with other cells and what it will do is change the sarcolemma to trigger a reaction. So like I said, where the two meet there is a gap called a synaptic cleft. And here the sarcolemma is known as the motor end plate. And both the motor end plate and the cleft contain an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. This enzyme is important because it breaks down acetylcholine to control the rate of the contraction. Now, ACH will only release if there's an electrical impulse, what is known as an action potential that the neuron releases. If there is interference of this, there are some conditions that may occur. One is botulism, which is caused by a bacterial toxin that can be found in canned foods. Uh, clostridium a toxin prevents the ACH release, which results in fatal paralysis. Now, there's also a genetically stimulated disorder that causes interference called my myasthenia gravis. It's a misguided attack by the immune system, so what it does is the autoantibodies will take up those receptor sites Therefore, the ACH cannot bind. Therefore, we have weakening of muscles. And it's usually indicated or early signs of it by a drooping eyelid. Now, if everything happens correctly, then we have the contraction cycle. Uh, if you remember, the triads are a link between the action potential and the start of a contraction because the action potential goes through the T tubules and triggers calcium ion release from the terminal cisterne. So these are the three parts of that triad. The calcium is going to stimulate that contraction response, as you can see here in the diagram. We have our axon terminal, we have the motor end plate, HCH will release from that electrical impulse, and then that action potential will reach the T tubule. Uh, sarcoplasm reticulum will then release the calcium to expose the active sites of actin and then form a cross bridge with that myosin head that results in a contraction of the muscle fiber. To relax it, the ACH will break down by the enzyme acetylcholine esterase. Through use of ATP and active transport, the sarcoplasmic reticulum will recapture the calcium. The active sites will become unexposed, so there's no cross bridge and the muscle will contract. I'm sorry, relax. Now, in the case of death, basically what happens is we don't have a relax relaxation phase. Uh, the circulation ceases, oxygen and nutrients are deprived, so the fibers run out of ATP and the sarcoplasmic reticulum cannot take that calcium back. So this creates a sustained reaction because without ATP, the cross bridges can't detach, creating this stiff as a board appearance. However, this cat, don't worry, it is alive, it's just stretching. And it will stay this way about one to six days depending on environmental factors. Um, it does start about two to seven hours after death and when the lysosomal enzymes begin to take over, they'll break down the myofilaments and eventually relax. Now, um, getting into what, a, what actually is produced from a contraction is uh, tension. And if we remember that individual muscle cells are surrounded and tied by connective tissue, then we'll realize that the contraction will pull on muscle fibers that create an active force. That active force we call tension. And so what's happening is the sarcomeres are shortening and the muscle fibers are being stimulated during this time. Now, remember, uh, it's important to note that the tension applied to an object pulls the object towards that source of tension. And in order for tension to occur, it's got to overcome a passive force of what we call resistance to create a movement. This all depends on the weight, shape, and friction. Um, muscle cells will then contract, which means they shorten and generate tension. Uh, they don't actively lengthen or compress. 
And so the amount of tension produced depends solely on the number of those pivoting cross bridges or actin myosin interactions. And we then, because of this fact, consider a fiber as either being on and producing tension or off and relaxed. And what this basically looks like with the skeletal muscle as a whole is uh, we have a muscle at resting length and then when it's contracted it will shorten the length of the muscle and bring uh, the muscle towards the source of tension. Now this is all determined by the frequency of the muscle fiber stimulation and then the number of muscle fibers stimulated. So a, a single stimulus contraction relaxation sequence in a muscle fiber we call a twitch. And a myogram kind of shows the phases of that twitch uh, the latent period, which lasts about two milliseconds, indicates that the action potential has reached a sarcolemma and the calcium ions have released. Then we have the contraction phase lasting about 15 milliseconds where the tension rises and peaks. And then finally the relaxation phase, which lasts the longest, about 25 milliseconds, where the calcium drops and the cross bridges decline and reduce tension. So these are very short time frames. So this is something that does happen very quick, even though when we're talking about it, it sounds like it might last a lot longer than that. Uh, keep in mind that individual twitches are not useful in a skeletal muscle. Uh, normal activities actually require repeated stimulations to result in sustained muscle contractions. So we're going to talk a second about that. Um, repeated stimulation before the relaxation phase ends can result in additional twitches or something we call summation. And summation will result in either incomplete tetanus where the tension peaks because the muscle isn't allowed to fully relax as you're shown here. Uh, the green arrow is stimulus so you can see that there are very quick stimulus and a peak, stimulus and a peak, stimulus and a peak, um, but we're never really, um, relaxation is never completely eliminated. Like in complete tetanus that showed here, we don't have any drops or re of relaxation, we just have continued stimulus, 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 stimulus. And so it keeps on rising. Now, again, uh, the, one of the other things that affects this is the number of muscle fibers that are actually activated. So smooth muscle contraction is controlled by the number of these fibers. And a motor unit is a single motor neuron. And of the fibers, it actually innervates or supplies with nerve stimulus. So uh, the motor unit size affects the control. And if we have less fibers, we have more precision. Uh, obviously more fibers and less precision. So what I'm talking about here is when we talk about the number of muscle fibers activated, every muscle fiber is controlled by a motor unit and some motor units control multiple muscle fibers. So if you look at the red, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, six uh, mo uh, muscle cells that are controlled by that motor unit. If we look at this greenish color, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven. So again, less fibers, more precision. And the activation of more and more motor units to create a movement would be called recruitment. Now, muscle tone results from motor units that, that just stay active. And uh, contractions are not enough to produce movement, but they can uh, produce slight tension and firm muscle resulting and tension in the skeletal muscle or something we call muscle tone. So if you have little tone, you have limp flaccid muscles. If you have moderate tone, you have firm solid muscles. So an example of muscles in your body that are usually continually contracted are your muscles involved with balance and posture. A lot of them are in your back. And so they have a lot of muscle tone because they are always um, tense. Now atrophy is where we have weakened or loss of muscle and it's usually stimulated um, by irregular non-use of a muscle. Um, initially it is reversible through physical therapy and or, uh, continued or starting back up of use but dying muscle fibers are not replaced so that's why it's so important to immediately start physical therapy after an injury or as we get older. Now, there are two classifications of muscle contractions. One is isotonic. Uh, the tension rises and remains the same until relaxation occurs. The muscle length changes. And some examples are like lifting an object off a desk, walking, or running. The uh, basic opposite of that is isometric, where the tension produced never exceeds the load, so the muscle length stays the same. 
and some examples, although they're probably not realistic, are pushing against a closed door or trying to pick up a car. So, uh, keeping your body upright even, or actions involving opposition of gravitational forces, are examples of isometric contractions. Now, as I stated before, there's no active mechanism for muscle fiber elongation. Um, it is a passive process, so the muscle naturally returns its original length due to the elastic forces or opposing muscles in gravity. So, recoil results following contraction under normal circumstances, or basically the relaxation phase happens normally. Okay, finally, 7-6. Um, ATP is the energy source for muscle contraction, and uh, contraction requires large amounts of energy. Uh, we're talking like there's 600 trillion molecules of ATP each second for the skeletal muscle, and that doesn't include ATP needed to pump calcium back into the SR sarcoplasm reticulum. ATP is generated at roughly the same rate it is used, and the way that that happens is uh, we have aerobic metabolism. That's our main source of ATP. Now, ATP, remember, is an energy transfer molecule. It isn't stored, and uh, creatine phosphate can release stored energy to convert ADP to ATP in an effort to use the energy from it. Uh, CPK, or cre creatine phosphokinase, will regulate these reactions. However, if there is serious muscle damage, uh, you can find CPK in test results because they, it leaks into the bloodstream during that damaged state. Energy use, fatigue, and recovery. Um, basically, if we run out of oxygen, then an anaerobic process known as glycolysis that breaks down glucose to generate ATP will begin to occur. Now, there isn't as much ATP produced in this scenario, so this only happens at peak levels of activity where the muscles will rely on this process and can access glucose for glycogen reserves in the sarcoplasm. ATP yield is not very significant when you compare it to the aerobic metabolism. And the glucose is converted to pyruvate, which converts to lactic acid eventually if it's not used up fast enough. This is where you get your muscle soreness. Um, and it also can result, result in muscle fatigue or the inability to contract due to a drop in pH levels. Uh, after we do get done activating a muscle, um, the recovery period always immediately begins. Um, and it is completed once the oxygen debt from that activity is made up. Alright, the last section we're going to talk about today in these notes is 7-7, muscle performance depends on fiber type and physical conditioning. So there are two factors that affect muscle performance, force and endurance. And uh, they rely on the capabilities of muscle fibers and physical conditioning to be at their peak state. And so we have two different types of fibers. We have fi fast fibers, uh, they're large in diameter, contain densely packed myofibrils, large glycogen reserves and few mitochondria. They can produce rapid and powerful contractions in a short duration, and uh, these types of muscles are often called white muscles because they appear white. Um, for example, with the white meat of chicken uh, that forms their wings because they don't use them as much except for quick, short responses. Slow fibers are small in diameter. They take three times as long to contract when stimulated, and some of the special characteristics include uh, extensive capillary supply, abundant mitochondria, high concentration of red pigment myoglobin, which is just a globular oxygen-carrying protein in the blood. And then finally, finally th this uh, type of muscle would be called a red muscle usually because it's generally considered as dark meat, at least for a chicken. And usually you see this kind of meat in the legs because it's something that's used very frequently. Now, just as a kind of interesting fact, humans contain a mixture of these two fibers, so that's why our muscles uh, look pink. Now, physical conditioning, there are two types as well. We'll start off with anaerobic endurance. This is a time over which a muscle can support sustained, powerful contractions. And the 50-yard dash, uh, or swim, pole vault weightlifting competitions, they require brief, intense workouts because of the anaerobic necessities. Um, anaerobic endurance can result in enlargement or hypertrophy of muscles, which is just basically 
uh, getting bigger muscles. Um, and then your aerobic endurance is the time over which your muscle can contract while supporting or why supported by mitochondrial activities. So jogging, distance swimming, other exercises that don't require peak tension production uh, because glucose is preferred energy source endurance athletes will actually carb load. So that's an example uh, for your aerobic endurance and um, I know for the cross country team before every race we always have a pasta dinner for this reason because we need that aerobic endurance. All right, that uh, wraps us up here for part two. Sorry, it was a little bit longer than I wanted it to be, but um, I had no way to get around that this time. So I will see you next time with part three and go back, pause, and play as needed.